Um, okay, so um, the talk I'm giving is on, so this was the title I was assigned, Pearls of Publication. Before I begin, uh, I want to ask um, a question of you. How many of you do not have somewhere in your academic title the term professor? Are there many of you? So you're, are you in the instructor series or research. research series? Okay. Those of you who are in the a series where you have the, the, the term professor in it, how many of you are in the clinical series? You are. Okay. How many, and back there, okay. How many of you are in the adjunct series? Okay. How many of you are in the, um, the in residence series? Okay. And are in tenure. Okay. How many of you don't know which series you're in? Okay. Is there anybody here who doesn't know which series you're in? Because I've done this in the past in another context, and I was amazed at how many people have a contract with UCLA and they don't understand what series they're in and therefore what's expected of them, what their rights are. So I, I, I think it looks like you guys have gotten good mentoring uh, and, and that's, that's very good because it used to be that we'd have people in the clinical series and they didn't really know what that meant. So it sounds like everybody's pretty well grounded. Anyway, all right, so with that little bit, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you about uh, pearls of publication. That was the title I was assigned, but I, I actually don't think it's, the most um, appropriate title. Uh, hmm. Whoops. No. Okay. So I think it's more like perils of publication. Okay. Because the the question is, what are the obstacles that you're going to encounter? What are the things you have to deal with? What are the issues that are going to come along? So so first of all, what I want to I want to do is get a feeling for what sort of experience most of you have with publication. So, so how many of you are relatively new at this and have less than five refereed publications? Can I see hands? Okay, quite a few of you. Good, all right. Now, how many have got somewhere between five and ten, somewhere in that range? Okay, all right. How about uh, you've published maybe 25? Okay, there's a, there's a great. How many of you published more than 25 papers? Steve, why isn't your hand up? We never should have made that contract. I, right. you know, right. so, you know, the question is always, are you, are you talking about first and last or anywhere? Anywhere. Oh, anywhere? Yeah. yeah, okay. All right, and how many of you have more than 50 publications in the group? Okay, there's somebody back there. So really, you should be up here giving the talk or you should leave. You, you don't really need to be here for this talk at all. However, if you have additional thoughts and ideas that you can add to what I'm telling the less experienced people, that would be valuable. All right? Okay, now... So what goes into a paper, all right? What should go into a paper? Now, yesterday, I, and I think I'll do it again today, I, I told a little story which really doesn't have anything to do with how you're going to write a paper, but it has to do with society's view of science and scientists and something that I found very revealing and to some degree somewhat dis disturbing. Um, when I was a postdoc, which was a long time ago, Okay, um, I took part in a sort of an experimental course in biology. This was at Brandeis, and they th th you have these breadth requirements when you're undergraduates. You know, you have to if you're a, if you're a science major, you have to take some history or literature courses, and if you're a literature major or a, or, a, or a, uh, some sort of liberal arts major, you have to take some science breadth courses. And I took part in a course um, where what they did was they divided the liberal arts. To, students up, freshmen and sophomores, into, who had to take a science breadth course uh, into a different kind of class. They had maybe 15 kids in the class. And instead of giving uh, you know, these didactic lectures where you got a little bit of uh, genetics and a little bit of developmental biology and so on, they actually had, a, had the students read directly from the scientific literature to show them that with a little coaching, they could actually you know, understand the scientific paper. And so, I took DNA as the hereditary material at this point. This was in the uh, late 1960s. And I knew that the first time we got together, they wouldn't have anything to read, so I, we had to have something to talk about when we first got together. So I asked them, well, what do you think would go into a scientific paper? If you were going to write a journal paper, something that you were going to communicate something to your, your peers and save it for posterity, what do you think would go into it? And they got the idea that there would be an abstract so people could decide whether they were interested in it or not, and that there would be an introduction 
which would sort of give the background of the area, and that there would be a place where you would talk about the techniques and how you did this, the materials and methods section, and that there would be a place where you would discuss the results and say what you, know, you thought it meant and what your, your opinions were. And that was it. And I said, well, what else? And nothing. They couldn't think of anything else that would go into this paper. And I asked, well, if you, when you write a paper for your history class or your literature class, um, what's the first thing you learn how to structure when you're thinking about writing this paper? And of course, everybody then realized, they said, well, a bibliography. And I said, well, why wouldn't you have a bibliography for a scientific paper? And what came out in the ensuing discussion was these were all kids who were taking a liberal arts major, and their view of who does science and how the science is done is that it's done by very introverted, um, iconoclastic, somewhat nerdy individuals who decide on doing something that's really arcane and not very relevant, do it in a room with no windows, you know, wrap it all up, put it in a box, put a bow on it, and put the box on the shelf because nobody else is ever going to want to open the box. And that's, a, a, I think, a very common conception of how people do science and who they are that, that, that does science. And, and I found it, I don't think that's changed a whole lot now. Um, and um, it, it's something that's always sort of troubled me because my wife's an artist and, and um, you know, I always think about, uh, people think of scientists as being relatively inc uncommunicative and, 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 or many people do think of scientists as being uncommunicative and, and, and um, introverted and so on. And, uh, you know, to me it's amazing because how many times have you seen a painting that was done by more than one person or a novel that was written by more than one person or a play that was written by more than one person. You'll sometimes see a piece of music where one person has written the score and the other person has written the book, but you know, like Lerner and Lowe, but, but that's it, right? You, you know, and yet, when is the last time you saw a real scientific paper with data in it that was done by only one person? You never see that. In fact, what you see is science done by a variety of people. I, just, I, had, a, I had an experience this morning where um, I talked with one of the people who's currently talking now is an Israeli scientist who I had to take over to a Japanese scientist who he's going to talk to next. Okay, so I have this American, Jewish American kid, guy, not kid, Jewish American guy taking this, this Israeli guy over to talk to this Japanese guy so I could come back and call one of my Chinese colleagues. And, and you know, your, our papers are published with a number of people and in fact science is an enormously interactive um, and borderless, I have friends all over the world, as I think many of the faculty here do, based on what we do in science, where, where you know, political do uh, dogma and, and social conventions play only a very secondary role in our relationships. And I think most people don't realize that. And the point of this sort of digression is that much of these relationships become established because of the papers you publish and the collaborations that you write. So the collaborations and papers that you write. And so there, there is a reason why I think how you write your papers, who you write them with, how you interact with people in publishing is a, a major aspect of our career as opposed to people who are in many other kinds of academic or, or creative environments and, and, and uh, endeavors. Okay, so that little diatribe. Uh, we'll go on and talk about what goes into a paper. Okay, well, one of the problems that I see that people encounter all the time when I'm, on, when I'm reviewing papers for people um, is, because I often, I often get asked to help, to, to look at drafts of manuscripts by people. I see some people wincing in the audience when I say that. Um, the, so the, the, one of the problems that I see people I encounter all the time is the problem of the, the urge to put every experiment you've done into a paper. Okay, this is really a natural urge. You spent two months at the bench doing this experiment. You got some data. The data is valid and real. And so, you know, you worked hard and you want to put it in the paper. Um, and it's particularly true if you've done the experiment yourself. But, but I think you really need to stop and think about that. And, and in many cases, you need to resist this urge. Okay, it's important when you're writing a manuscript that you're not writing what you did chronologically. You're not, you're not writing... I did this experiment, I did that experiment, I did that experiment by opening your notebook and looking at the dates and writing what you did on different dates. What you're trying to do is you're trying to tell a cohesive story. And very often at the end of the story, at the end of the last experiment, then you understand what went on in the middle experiment and why it's not so relevant 
Okay, but resist the urge to want to put that experiment in because what you want to do is you want to get home the story that you're trying to finish up telling, okay? And, and it just is simply diverting. So even if it worked, it doesn't mean that it should go in the manuscript if it's going to divert the reader, the referee, or the reader um, from the story that you're trying to tell. Now, this is a, a really hard lesson to learn, I find, um, with people very often when I'm talking about manuscripts with people. But the important thing is that you want to tell the story that you want to get across. What is it that you want people to remember? Not all the experiments you did, but the flow and the bottom line. And I must tell you that this is particularly difficult when you've got students or postdocs in your lab. You can understand it. They're, this is the first time they've written a paper, or the second or the third time. They've done this experiment, and by God, they worked really hard on it. The results are good. You know, they make the point, and why the hell shouldn't it go in the paper? Well, the reason it shouldn't go in the paper is because it's not part of the story that you ultimately want to tell, okay? And I think the hardest part of being a mentor sometimes, well, one of the difficult parts of being a mentor anyway, is to, to, to get this idea across that doing science is different from telling about science, okay? Doing science, you're in the moment. Telling science, you're talking about the continuum that leads you to the bottom line. Okay, so I think this is something that you, 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 you really, as mentors, you really need to think about um, and, and consider this when you're, when, you're, when you're writing manuscripts. Another one of the things I want to talk about is authorship and the, one of the perils. Okay, one of the things when you're, when you're set, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in collaboration, and we, we collaborate with a lot, a lot of people. But when you're setting up collaborations with people, whether you initiate them or somebody else initiates them, I think it's really important to try and sort of set the boundary conditions for who in your laboratory is going to be involved and make it clear with your collaborator that they're going to be like two postdocs or, or two postdocs and a graduate student who are probably going to play a role so that they should, should know that that's going to happen when it comes time to writing the manuscript, that it's not just you and you're going to thank the other people in your laboratory. That, um, that uh, you plan on having several people involved. A lot of people um, try to you know, figure out what the authorship is going to be before you establish a, a, a collaboration, before you start working on a paper. I don't do that because you never know. I mean, if it's a collaboration where both laboratories are participating fairly equally, you never really know which set of experiments is going to play the lead in the final in the final document, then you're trying to find out something new, and it's not clear which lab is going to have the, 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 the breakthrough. So I, I then tend not to try and plan what the, what the authorship list is going to be, um, but I do try to make clear that it's going to be two or three people from my lab. And it's important from both sides, because you don't want them, your, your collaborator, to say, well, I, you know, I didn't expect you to have three people on this paper. I mean, I've only got one postdoc working on it. You know, that you don't want them to say that, and you can understand why you don't want them to say that. On the other hand, you don't want to be working with somebody who's got a laboratory of 14 people and wants to put six of them on a paper that you weren't expecting. You were expecting only one or two people. So I think you need to sort of establish these boundary conditions pretty, er pretty early in, in interacting with people. So, and my own personal philosophy, which you know, I, I can afford to do this at this point. I mean, I'm a category distinguished professor and I don't have to worry about who's going to be on our, on our papers. And I think you need to worry about it a little more perhaps at your stages. But my philosophy is to try to be relatively generous about who's an author as long as you don't have 14 people on the paper uh, that only six of whom belong there. But, but if, it's, if it's a borderline call, I generally say fine. You know, let's, let's say that's fine. That person can go ahead and be on the paper. I tend not to be restricted because I want to keep good relationships with my colleagues. And um, it's, it's, it's really about who's the first author and who's the corresponding author that's critical in, um, in how people evaluate publications anyway. Uh, the tendency now is to say these two people, uh, two first authors, co contributed equally to it. But on the other hand, when somebody's looking at the manuscript, you know, they cite Jones et al., not Jones and Smith et al., because they're two coordinate author. So there's a lot of politicking in that, in that, in that business about co-authorship. But um, I, I tend to be pretty generous uh, in this regard at this point. Okay. Another question about uh, authorship that I think that comes along is there's a, there's a major, major, this may, this, this may the, the context, context of Big Kahuna may be 
Uh, you may be too young to understand that reference, but the big question is if you're approached or if you approach somebody who's very well known, you know, a Hughes member, a National Academy of Sciences member, somebody who's very well established in the field about collaboration, the question is should you collaborate, particularly I think uh, almost all of you are in the non-tenured series at this, you're, you're not non you're not tenured, you're not at the associate professor level. And the issue of, of should you publish with, with major figures in the field um, collaboratively becomes an issue because the question is who gets recognition for that, right? And it's particularly important when you're thinking about, about promotions and to a lesser um, uh, um, point, it's, it's uh, a, a consideration in, in, grant, in grant writing. Um, and so my feeling is that if there's something to be gained scientifically and you can work out the conditions properly, you know all about this, um, it's, it's worth doing the experiments and working with somebody who's, who's a major figure if, there, if there's something to be ba gained mutually beneficial. But it's not a trivial question. And what I think you need to do if you're in the assistant professor stage is you really need to have a heart-to-heart -heart with that person and explain to them that, you know, they probably are aware of it, but you want to make it explicit that you need to establish a reputation as an independent investigator and try to get that person to understand that your being the senior author on this paper is going to mean a hell of a lot more to you than it is to them if this is a close call. Uh, who's going to be the corresponding author is something that you should try to get worked out with that person if they're, if they're a big, big name and you're not. Try to get that worked out in advance. And the other thing is, if you're doing this either with somebody at your own institution or at another institution and you're an assistant professor in any series and you're going to be coming up for, for at some point for promotion, it's, I think it's really worth, again, having a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with that person because either you or the department is going to ask them to submit a letter supporting your, your promotion. And I think it's really important for, the, for you to ask them to make sure to talk about the, the vital aspects of your, of your contribution to that work. Okay? I think this is only you, I think, can take your best interest to heart and do this kind of thing. Okay? If you've got a good chairman or you've got a good mentor, they can maybe run that interference for you. But I think really you, you need to think about it lying on your own, on your own um, responsibility. Okay? All right? But, by the way, you can stop me at any point and we can talk about some of these points. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss them further. Um, okay. The other thing is when you write a paper, I think one of the most important things is the abstract that you write. You, you want to write what, what I call a gotcha abstract. I mean, you want the referee, you want the reader, one that's in, in a journal. You know, you just don't want to say, we did the following experiments, ta-da, okay? You, 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 I don't want you to belabor it, but you want a bottom line that makes somebody want to read the data to understand why you say you've come to this particular conclusion. And so, you know, your abstract should, should I think, include a clear statement of what the question is that you're asking, then a description of what you did, but then a real bottom line statement about what you think the conclusion is and, and, and why it's important to the field. Okay, now it's hard to do in 200 words and also um, describe some of the experiments. Um, and I, I just, we're working on a paper now where actually the, the journal asks you to write the purpose, the, the, um, the, the uh, not exactly methodology, I can't remember what they did, but the experimental procedures, the results, and the conclusion. And I think that's actually a good exercise and a good thing for journals to do. Um, again, it's a 200-word thing, and it's, it's hard to do, but if you think about trying to fit that into your abstract, I think, I think it's really valuable to do. The abstract really needs to tell the reviewer why they should want to read the paper, what the take-home message is, you know, why this is a paper that you want to wade your way through and why it's worthwhile. I, the, the way I think about it is, okay, if this paper were going to be presented at a journal club, what would the take-home message be that the postdoc or student wants the rest of the lab to get from it, okay? If your abstract has that in it, I think, you know, that's, that's the sort of how, how to grab people kind of thing, all right? So the other thing I would say is avoid hyperbole. 
Um, I think that I, it, I, I often, in reading other people's papers for, for them and commenting on them, uh, I, there's almost always a red line in, through the words interesting or surprising. I'm really a very firm believer that it's up to the referees to decide whether the, the results you've presented are interesting or surprising or paradigm shifting, earth shaking, mind boggling. I, I don't know how many times I've read people that say, our surprising result, well, maybe it's surprising and maybe it isn't to the reader, okay? And it's not up to you to make that call, okay? You can, you can say, I think it's fair to say, we were surprised by this, but I don't think it's fair for you to generalize to the rest of the, to the, rest of the scientific community that this is an, even an interesting, let alone a surprising <laughs> result, okay? Um, and I, I just, it's, it's something that I find um, s sort of uh, an amateurish way to present your results, okay? I think it's, it's, it, it, it means that you lack, to me it means that you lack perspective because it's up to other people to, to determine whether something that you've done is, is interesting or not. You can express an opinion about it, but you shouldn't draw the conclusion that it's interesting or surprising. Okay, there's also, this is again, it's not really uh, anything to do with hyperbole. It's something I just had to get off my chest when I was preparing the slides. I, there's a phrase that drives me nuts when I, when I read uh, papers. You know, people say, it has been shown that, as I say here, it has been shown that the moon is made of green cheese, and then they give a reference. Well, okay, why not just say the moon is made of green cheese and give the reference, you know? Um, and I'll, I'll read papers where, for some reason, this seems to be an easy way to get into the next paragraph, okay? The people use this as a transitional phrase, which is not really transitional to anything. It's just, it's just redundant. And so I would advise you, in terms of quality of writing, to avoid um, it has been shown that. The other thing is, I must say, I, I'm, I'm collaborating on a paper with a very, very well-known scientist right at the moment. Somebody from my laboratory is working in another laboratory, and we're doing a draft. And this very, very well-known scientist has wanted her to put in there, I counted 11 times in the paper, we noted that, you know, in introducing the next experiment that they did. And I cross it out, but he's such a big name that I suspect we'll leave it in, okay? <laughs> Um, but uh, I'm, because I'm leaving it up to her because I don't want her to get caught in the middle. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Um, sometimes I think that type of phrase is used not only to introduce a fact, but also to uh, talk about that there's controversy. Yes, so yes. In that context? It, well, I wouldn't say it has been shown that. I, what I would say is Smith has reported that the moon is made of green cheese, but in contrast, Joan... Jones has, uh, has uh, published a manuscript that says that actually it's, it's, it's made of soft gouda. You know? and, and in that context, I think, yes, it's, it's OK to, to say that A has shown and B has shown. That's fine. And, and our experiments are designed to, in, to interpret it. And that's, in fact, somebody asked me a question about this yesterday, too. There's another context in which um, somebody said, well, what about if it's our work? You know, and I, and I said, that depends. Uh, you know, a lot of you know that we work on COX-2, and, and um, we've, I'll say in a paper, COX-2 has been shown to mediate, uh, be involved in the, uh, uh, mechanistically in the mediation of inflammatory uh, responses, chronic inflammatory responses, acute uh, um, inflammatory responses, uh, tumor progression, and I'll cite papers for each of those things. And like we've done a lot of work on tumor promotion, pro, um, uh, promotion, and I'll put our paper just as a number or reference in there. But I won't say that we've shown this. On the other hand, if the second, if we're doing something where what we want to do is follow up on something that we've shown that comes out of our laboratory, and the point is that we're following up on something that we did, then I will say our laboratory previously reported this. And now we want to go on and examine that in more detail and understand it mechanistically. In that context, yeah. OK? Does that answer your question? Is that? OK. All right, so what's next here? OK, here's another point. You know, you just don't know everything about what you're writing about. OK? And, but most importantly, you don't know what you don't know. OK? You remember Donald Rumsfeld? What was the co comment? There are things we know that we don't know, and there are things that we don't know that we don't know. Well, there are a lot of things that you don't know. Now, the stuff he was talking about was 
the war in Iraq, which was not, you know, a lot more important than what we're talking about, but nevertheless, um, what, when you write a paper, you know, you'll read it half a dozen times or a dozen times, and what may seem obviously and obviously clear to you in your draft may not, in fact, be very clear to anybody else. And after you've read it three or four times, after you're now into the eighth or tenth or twelfth time, you know exactly what the idea was that you're trying to convey. And so you skip over what you've written, because you're not reading it in context. You know what you, you, know what you meant to say. But it may not be what you actually said on paper. And you're not a good judge of it at this point. So um, it's very, very easy for you to understand your intention, but to miss the point that um, you haven't made it clear. And therefore, like everybody else who will give you advice, they'll tell you to have your manuscript read by other people. Okay, so, and I think your, your final draft should be read by at least two colleagues. Okay, and, and they should have different kinds of experience. And, uh, first of all, you've got to trust their judgment and their frankness. Okay, it's just no good to give somebody a paper and they'll say, oh yeah, this looks great. You know, that, what you really want is somebody's going to go through and tell you what they think the problems are. Okay, um, and, and you want at least one colleague who should really know a great deal about the topic, who's intimate with the particular area of science that you're dealing with so that they can judge, you know, <coughs> whether the experiments you've done are really correct, <coughs> pardon me, correctly interpreted um, and, and correctly explained at a very highly technical level. And then the other kind of person you should have to read is somebody who has a broader, more global interest in the topic that you're talking about and related topics so they can see how well it relates to the, to the general field. And it, you know, if you have people who can do both of those things, I think, I think it, it's very valuable and you get very good feedback. Um, and you want to give them enough time to read it. You want to give them you know, a week or 10 days and ask them if they can read it and get it back to you. And when they give you back the comments, if they've done it right, first thing you've got to do is say is relax Take a deep breath, swallow your pride, and then consider carefully the comments they've made, okay? Because if they've done it right, and they're being frank, and they're trying to help you, they will not spare the horses. They will tell you what they think is wrong with the paper, and better them than a referee. Same thing with grants. We're not talking about grant writing here, but it's not, that, that, the, this policy is the same for grant writing too. It's better to have your colleagues see all your foibles than your, than, your, than your evaluators, okay? We're here to help you. You know, when we give you a rough review on something that you give us to read as senior colleagues, we're trying to help, believe it or not. You may not believe it when you see some of the comments, but we are really trying to help you, okay? So, so let, take your, get, get people who you know are critical and get them to help you with, um, uh, by reading your manuscript. So this is what I regard as the best of all possible worlds in terms of the timeline. First, write that penultimate draft. Get what you think is pretty much near the last draft. Then put it in a drawer, because you've read it 12 times in the last four days. Put it in a drawer, and go do something else, and then come back a week later and read it again. And you'll be surprised how now some of the things that you thought were clear weren't clear. But you know what you're trying to say, and you'll edit it, okay? Then after you've done that, give it to those colleagues and have them read it. And give them a week or 10 days. Then review their comments, okay? And when you get their comments, so like I said, get over your anger, your despair, your, your, your resignation, stop thinking about an alternative career and get back to what you're doing, you know? And, and, um, and, and take what they're saying to heart because, you know, people don't invest their time in that to try and beat up on you. They're trying to invest their time to, to help you. I know sometimes it doesn't look like that, but it really is the case. Okay, and then considering what will now, after you relax a little bit, appear to be more helpful comments, you know, rewrite the thing and then submit the manuscript. And, you know, it's uh, with me, when manuscripts go out or grants go out, whether or not it gets published or funded at that point is sort of secondary. I'm just glad to get the damn thing out of my office at that point, okay? And, you know, I'll worry about whether it gets published or not um, down the line. Okay, now also the other thing is, you know, be realistic in what journal you select. I've had this conversation with people before. You know. Should this, is this a cell paper? Is it a nature paper? Is it a science paper? Is it a New England Journal of Medicine paper? You know, is it in, the, is it in that, that level of sexiness caliber or not? So, you know, it, a lot of times it's a close call. 
Um, and this is where consultation with senior members of your department will uh, be helpful and valuable. Uh, do you know if there's a class in here at one o'clock or something going on at one? Do we have to be out at one? Can you, yeah, because if, if there is, then I'll, I'll have to rush through some of this. But this is where um, consultation with senior members of your department and your mentors can really be helpful. They can help you decide based on their experience whether or not they think you have a shot at um, you know, Nature or, or the New England Journal, okay? Um, and so take their, you know, listen to their advice and then, then make your decisions. Okay, so the role of the corresponding author. Now you're the corresponding author. This is coming out of your laboratory. We're okay. We're okay? All right, good. So you're responsible for the whole thing. The bottom line, as I say here, rests with you. You're the person uh, who has to see that the final version of the manuscript really is ready to be submitted. You're the person who corresponds with the journal editor. We'll talk about that in a minute. I, I don't know how to do figures these days with the way you have to put them to submit to journals. So, I, you know, postdocs do that. Postdocs write the drafts. But I look to make sure that the figures look right. If they don't look right, I send them back to the, to the whatever program it is they use on a computer to do these figures and say, no, make this font bigger, you know, things like that. Um, so, you know, even if you can't figure out about this crap about how to submit figures, you know, you, the bottom line on the appearance and the content of the manuscript really rests with you. Okay, now, many of us have had Promethean battles with our advisors when we were students about the context of papers, so be prepared for a lot of arm wrestling. But, you know, the bottom line does rest with you. Um, you got to make sure that all the forms are filled out right. The, the bottom line is that anything that goes wrong is going to come back on your desk. Okay, so you want to try and avoid the pitfalls of submitting a manuscript as much as possible because you're the person who's going to get, who's responsible for, for um, figuring out how to fix the mess. Okay, so let's not have a mess. Okay, that would be the, the, the take home message here. So one of the things you have to do when you submit electronically now, you know, there's, there's a place where you have to submit your letter to the editor. Now, in my view, letters to the editor are essentially useless unless you happen to know the editor and you can write, hey, Bob, you know, this is really something that's important to me. Um, uh, I, I, would fi I find that the letter to the editor is pretty much useless because a good, a good abstract will say everything that you want to say to the editor. And so it's basically going to be redundant to your abstract. You're just going to expand. In, the abstract is 200 words. You may want to expand on why it's important. But pretty much, um, I think it's important to, to, to go ahead and do what they ask you to do. But the one thing I think you can do in the letter to the editor that you don't do in the abstract is you can explain to the editor why this paper won't be interesting just to six people why it'll be interesting to a relatively uh, a, a broader readership uh, within the specialty of the journal to which you're submitting. You can, you, it's pretty hard to do that in the abstract. You, can't, you can say why you think it's, it's uh, uh, what you think is new about it, but you, you can't say who, that'll, who it'll necessarily appeal to in your abstract, but you can in the letter to the editor. So you can try and convince him or her that it's worth them thinking about the fact that Yes, it's going to the Journal of Biological Chemistry, but it's going to be interested. People are interested in st structure of the molecule you're studying, in uh, enzymatic activity of the molecule you're studying, in why inhibition of that molecule might have clinical significance, how it works mechanistically in the process of development or disease. These are things that it's hard to put all of that into. You know, you can say it's going to appeal to all these people. That won't go in an abstract, and that's the kind of thing I think where the letter to the to the editor can be marginally useful. Okay, so you submitted the paper, it's gone off to the editor, they've eaten written back to you and said, I'm sorry, we can only publish 10% of the papers that we get submitted to us. Many of you have seen that letter and it's just not sexy enough for us. Um, and so you decide, okay, then we're gonna submit it to another journal. Otherwise they say, okay, it's gonna go out to referees. Anywhere between three weeks and six months later, you get the comments back from the referee a referees, sometimes you've written the editor of the journal twice to ask what's happened. Are they still alive? Is there still an office back there? You know, um, and then you get the comments from the referee. Okay, so the first thing you do is you look at the referee's comments. They're four pages long, and you think, oh, shit. You know, what is going on here? You know, and you, and you, you get pissed off, and you put it in a drawer. Okay, that's an, a reasonable reaction. 
Okay. But then take it out of the drawer and read it. Because you may find you know, that, in fact, they're, they're fairly extensive comments, but in fact, they're easily to de easy to deal with. Referees come in two groups. There's one group that says, um, this point needs to be expanded on. This experiment uh, has the following faults. Okay. Then there are other referees who say, in line six of paragraph three on page seven, that should be present tense rather than past tense. And um, you used a plural noun and a, and a singular verb in paragraph six. You know, and, um, and they'll talk about your spelling errors and your grammatical errors. And they won't just say, oh, you've got spelling errors and grammatical errors. They'll go through the list and say where your punctuation should be a semicolon instead of a comma. Okay. And those are really very easy to fix. Okay. Um, so if the set of comments is something that you can respond to, then I, I have a standard format that I do. You know, I, I um, talk about re referee number one, and then comment number ref from referee number one, and I requote the comment in italics. Okay, so the comment is right there, and then in another in another font, in a normal font, I put my response, and it'll be oops, it'll either be a uh, a, 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 a I wouldn't a, a rebuttal in the sense of a subtle nice rebuttal saying, well, you know, this is um, why we think that th this part of the experiment is in fact valid and doesn't need the, the, the control that you suggested. It's built into another control. Or uh, if in fact you've made a correction. We, we had a paper just recently that went to JBC and we got back and somebody pointed out that they thought we'd left the, 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 the um, ligand in for the whole period of time that we're exposing the, the cells. And I understand why they thought that, because it turns out we had written it slightly incorrectly, and it could be misinterpreted. So I said, right, you know, and, and I've corrected this in the methods, and I've corrected it in the figure legend. That's all it does. So you just describe the correction you made. And what I would do is then also quote exactly in the, in, in the response to the reviewer, I will quote the change that we made and underline the change so that it's very clear to them. That even though it's in the manuscript, I'll also describe it in the, in the um, in the uh, response to the reviewer. Now, your responses to reviewers tend to get very long if you do that, but in my view, that's fine. If you can overwhelm them with volume, <laughs> that is sometimes a very, a very useful way to do it because you know, the reviewer doesn't want to spend any more time on this paper than he or she has to. <laughs> and you know, they read it, and they thought about it, and they said, oh, yeah, OK, this is wrong. And if you give them a nice, succinct, pleasant response to each of their points, they're going to say, all right already, OK, OK. You know? And, and it, I mean, I do it as a reviewer, and I presume my colleagues have the same kind of, kind of response. If you disagree with a referee's conclusion, I will often say, you know, and, but, you've, but you think that they, you know, they, they've concluded the wrong thing because they didn't get it. I mean, they really just didn't get it. You, know, you said what you meant to say. And it seems clear to you, but they didn't get it. Then I will often say, you know, I'm sorry I didn't make this point more clearly. Because in point of fact, if they didn't get it, you didn't make it clearly. Okay? They may be stupid, but even a stupid reviewer has to be told clearly the point you're trying to be made, that your point you're trying to make. So assume that they didn't get it because you didn't say it twice. Okay? And say it twice and tell the reviewer how you've corrected that. Go ahead and make your point again and expand on it in the text of the manuscript Say, I gather I didn't make this clearly. Let me tell you how I've tried to make it um, more clear to the reader, and then quote what you've done, the, added, the two sentences you've added to make the point more clearly. Even if you don't think they're necessary, I think it's better than arguing about whether the sentence you wrote is clear. OK? They're just sort of common sense things, I think. OK, so then you package it all up, you send it back off, and, and, you, and you hope that you've worn the reviewer down, right? OK, now, responding to the editor is different. Okay? It really differs from the response to the reviewer. If you think the reviewers have made a fundamental error in their understanding of the work, you need to make your case in a, in a letter to the editor. And if the reviewer has really, really missed the boat, and it's, you don't think it's repairable by saying, I guess I didn't make this clear to you, then I think you need to write a letter to the editor. And sometimes I think it pays to do that before you even respond to the referees. Just write to the editor and say, look, you know, Referee two just didn't get it. How shall we work on this? Because referees one and three seem to understand, and they, they're okay. 
how, how can we work on this together to try and, and, and see whether this is right or not? I think it's, right, it's, it's reasonable to do that sort of offline um, uh, to make the case. But if you are going to write the editor and, and do that, I think you really need to make your argument as clearly as you can. And it's at this point where you have to make this decision. Somebody, people have said, well, what about just asking the, referee, the re editors to get another referee to ameliorate this? Sometimes referees, re editors will do this on their own. They'll get two reviews. They'll send it out. That's why you'll sometimes have a four-month delay, because they'll be sending it out to another person. A good editor will do that if they, if they don't feel competent to make the decision themselves. Um, so you, you might want to ask the, the editors for another referee, a new referee, but you need to bear in mind that that often is not a very profitable way to go, um, asking for a new reviewer. And, and the reason is the dynamics of the whole reviewing process. Editors have to send out, you know, I don't like reviewing papers, unless it's something that's interesting to me and I think it's high quality, it comes from a good laboratory and I'm going to learn something from it. Um, but if I get a paper from, you know, a journal that's okay on a topic that's, that I know something about, but I don't think it'll be particularly interesting, but it might be worth publishing, I'm, I'm not thrilled with having to do that because it takes my time, okay? And so if you, if you send out a paper like that to six people as an editor and two of them say, yes, I'll review it, and four of them tell you, gee, you know, I've got a funeral tomorrow and I've got, you know, a, a meeting to go to the next day and so on, and I just can't do it. You know, those two people that are going to review the paper for you as an editor, you feel grateful to them, okay? And you want to use them again, and you will use them again. And so editors build up a stable of reviewers, and they don't want to offend those people, okay? So if they, generally what will happen is an editor unless the person is a good scientist, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, unless the, unless the editor is a good scientist and can see the points and knows the field, will tend, if there's a conflict between a reviewer and an author, to side with the reviewer because he's got a vested interest in siding, he or she has got a vested interest in siding with the reviewer because he wants to keep that person in his stable. Okay, so generally, if you ask for another review, what will happen is the paper doesn't get sent out de novo to a new reviewer what happens is the paper will get sent out to um, a new reviewer along with all the reviews. So when you, plus the letters to the editor. So when you, when you are called on to do a review as, a, as an arbitrating reviewer, you'll get the manuscript, you'll get the comments of the reviewers, and you'll get the rebuttal to those comments, okay? And at this point, you know, it's such a nightmare, you just say, ah, you know, uh, you already got two reviews, leave me alone. Um, and so it, it, it's just human nature. The tendency is that editors will tend to, whoops, what happened here? I think we want don't send, right? Okay, so um, the, te the tendency will be for um, this not to be a very successful approach. Sometimes, okay, particularly if the editor is a good scientist. Um, but a lot of times, well, we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, well, I guess we'll talk, let me go back and talk about it. Um, the, the question of what kind of journals do the best reviewing. In my view, the kinds of journals that do the best reviewing are, in fact, the journals that aren't the sexiest journals. They're the journals that are society journals, where the editors are scientists well-known in their field who will... Um, will uh, uh, be expert in many, in, in sometimes in your area, but sometimes not in your area, but they'll have uh, associate editors who are expert in your area, and they're practicing scientists who can review the literature, okay? And, you know, JBC or Journal of Virology, Journal of Bacteriology, things like that, where the editors are really practicing scientists. The, the really, the private journals, as opposed to, the, to the, the society journals, journals like Nature, Cell, Science, most of the editors are not very highly qualified scientists. I mean, most of the people who, who handle the review of your manuscript are people who have a PhD and then went into you know, the, the journalism direction uh, without much experience in doing science. And they are not really very good at evaluating the quality of work, and so they leave it to the, re re the reviewers. And as a result, appealing to the editor 
I think at one of those journals often doesn't work very well because they'll just send your appeal on to the, to the reviewer who gave you the crappy review in the first place. And so it's my, it's my um, experience that dealing with reviewers and editors from society journals with bad reviews, you can tend to be more, more by bad, I, I, mean, I don't mean critical, I mean ones where they miss the boat. You, you can be more successful with society journals than you can with the sort of uh, scientific society journals than you can with the heavy, heavy, heavy duty uh, sexy journals, okay? Um, Okay, and, and this brings me to a topic that we talked actually a lot about yesterday because people got interested in it. And it's something that, that um, I don't know if you were there for this discussion. I think you may have left. This, this is really an interesting topic. Um, and it's a question of where you should publish to some degree and how you should publish. Um, it's what I call the home run theory of publishing versus the successive hits theory of publishing. The, the question is, you know, if you want to publish a paper in Cell, or science or nature. Generally, what they'll have is six figures uh, in the paper and 15 supplementary figures, right? You, you basically got three manuscripts worth of data in there to get a paper published in cell or, or, or nature or science. And from the time, I mean, to get a paper published in some of these journals, from the time you have an idea, you have to get all the way to a clinical trial in order for the journal and the referees and so on to say, okay, this manuscript should go in. In, in cell. And the, the question of, is whether you want to try to hit home runs and take the time to do all that and deal with the referees. Very often you'll send a paper off to cell or to nature, which you think is a, is a story. And the, the referees will say, well, this is a good story, but I don't think it's ready for cell unless you do the following seven experiments, which will take you another eight or nine months to do. And then you do those experiments, you put it all together, they send it back to, that referee is now dead or incompetent, or maybe still able to review, and they say, well, yeah, these support the argument, but you know, there's this wrong with that experiment, and there's this wrong with that experiment. By the time you're done, if you do successfully get the paper into cell, it's 18 months to two years from the time you first submitted it. Okay, so the question is, do you wanna do that, or do you wanna publish the first story in cancer research instead of cell, and then publish the next chapter in cancer research and the next chapter. And it, it's, it's not a question of what's right and wrong. I'm not trying to talk to you about what you should or shouldn't do. It's just a, a I won't call it a paradox, but it's, it's an issue that you come up with. And for me, it was always a question of, okay, how do I want to operate? Do I want to, do I want to try and battle with the star system for sell, or do I want to publish in, in um, uh, uh, society journals where the issue is not sexiness but quality of the work? Okay, and I, I tend to go toward the latter. Although you know we have our we have our we have our, our our cell papers and our science papers and our New England Journal of Medicine papers from my laboratory as well, but we tend to publish in you know cancer research, journal of biological chemistry, things like that because I just don't like the the. The, the trauma of trying to do, deal with prima donna referees and editors. Um, and I always thought about it in that context. But recently, uh, do, how many of you know who Martin Raff is? No? Good Lord. Molecular Biology of the Cell, the major textbook that people use that revitalized and, 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 and re-educated everybody uh, and is probably the most common textbook used in cell biology courses. One of the major authors of that is Martin Raff. Fame is really fleeting, guys, you know, in this business. I mean, we may stand on the shoulders of giants, but n nobody knows their name down there, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> Martin is a superb scientist and a really uh, integrative individual who, who wrote one of the dominant textbooks in the field. And, and in the days when he was actually publishing science, he was, he was a dominant figure in immunology. Um, uh, anyway, he had an editorial article recently, and I can't remember what it was. It might have been in Biotechniques or something like that, talking about the question of whether we should go with the home run theory where you've got to, where you've got to satisfy the referee with 12 more papers, you know, with basically rolling three papers into one in order to get a paper into Nature or Cell, or, or whether you should publish the story successively, not from the point of view of your career, but how it affects science. 
how it affects the progress of science. And Martin's, um, Martin's uh, bottom line on this was that if people have to write the entire story with eight supplemental figures or 10 supplemental figures because the journal only allows four or five, and you're writing basically an entire another story in the supplemental figures, that in fact, that slows the progress of science because during the time that you're mounting, you know, you've made this first observation, and during the time that you're building on that observation for science or cell or nature, you're, you're building the story that they want you to tell that the stuff you've done isn't out there for other people to understand and to build on. And so the first experiment which you did two and a half years ago, isn't in the literature for two and a half years. Whereas if you publish it in, I mean, now we, we, I'm not talking about the so-called MPU, you know, the, the minimal publishable unit, which some people talk about is what's the minimum I can put into a paper. That's not the point. The point is that if you have a, a substantial story, that's the first part of a series that you're going to build, do you want to publish as an individual story or do you want to, you know, tell it as a sequence? And Martin's point was, in this editorial, that it actually serves science better if you publish it in chunks. Because then that first observation that you made gets published six or eight months after you made it, that first story gets published six or eight months after. Everybody knows about it, and people can take it off, take off on it and do their, their expansion on it. And so that expanding the, the overall body of knowledge, instead of being linear in your paper, goes off like that. And that more science is done based on the work that comes out of your laboratory if you publish meaningful, significant re results in a, in, a, in a series than if you um, publish an entire flow of story from, from conception to, to uh, as I say, say clinical trial um, in, 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 one, in one story. I, I'm not saying what's right or wrong, okay? Uh, there, there are certainly arguments on why you should strive to hit home runs and to publish papers and sell in science and tell complete stories and not tell partial stories. I could put on a different hat and make the argument. Um, or I can give you Raf's perspective on this. Um, it's, it's not something I'm trying to convince you to do one way or the other, but it is something you might want to think about in the context of your own work and your own, and your own uh, career and your own objectives. Okay, I think we're coming up to the last one. Yeah, that, here's the question. You're a junior faculty member, and the question is, you get asked to write a review article. Should you write a review article? Is there any value in it for you? Is there any reason why you should go ahead and write a review article? Well, this is, again, something that depends. It depends on the journal that it's going to appear in. If you're asked to write an article, a review article, for nature or science or annual reviews of biochemistry, no question, you should do that because it's you're going to get a lot of name recognition for do that, okay? So that's really worth doing. Um, it also depends on the point where you are in your career, okay? If I, you know, if, if I get asked to write a review article versus if you get asked to write a review article for a good but not an outstanding journal, you know, it'll add, it'll add to my, people will know my name, they'll recognize it, they'll, they'll, they'll read it because I've written it, frankly, um, if it appears in, you know, like JBC or something like that. Um, it will not necessarily enhance your um, career, either in terms of getting a grant funded or getting a promotion to have a review article on your CV in lieu of having bona fide referee uh, publications. Okay, so if it's going to take time for you to do that away from you doing your research, unless it's for a major, a major recognized um, publication, like I say, like um, annual reviews of whatever your, your field is in, um, I would say no. Okay, it also depends on your goal for the article. Uh, sometimes you want to learn about a new field, and I'll tell you a story from my own lab in a minute. Um, uh, you, if you want to solidify your understanding and get your arms around it, you're getting ready to write a grant in what's a relatively new area for you, and you want to you get to know the field, that's, that's a, it's a good way to do that. Um, it isn't going to help your promotions, as I say. What about in terms of positioning yourself for a grant? So I can tell you a story from my own lab. We can't do a control on this. We do a lot of work trying to do um, uh, vector-directed gene therapy for uh, metastatic cancers. 
and um, we use adenovirus. And one of the problems with using adenovirus is that adenovirus is highly immunogenic. It evokes an innate immune response in individuals who, who haven't been exposed to adeno. And then a lot of us carry um, circulating T cells and antibodies to adeno that will, will um, neutralize it. And so the question is, if you're going to think about using adeno, how do you get over these immunological uh, problems? Well, we have a grant where we've done a lot of targeted stuff in nude mice, but now we have to deal with this question. If we're going to go any further, we have to deal with this question of <coughs> immune response to the virus. And I had a, had a postdoc who, fortunately, very bright young woman, who uh, uh, asked to come work in my laboratory as a postdoc who did her PhD thesis on uh, innate immune responses to adeno and adeno-associated virus. Uh, wonderful, you know, come. And it was time for us, she came, and it was time for us to renew the grant. And I said, look, um, nobody knows your name, um, and I want to get recognized in this field, so why don't we write a review on adeno-associated and adenoviruses and Im immunology, the immune response to, adeno to adenovirus vectors. And we did that, and we published it in a middling journal. But one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was to position ourselves so that when we put in the grant request saying, okay, we're going to move from working in nude mice to working in, in, to, in, in, in an immun immunologically competent system and, um, and uh, try to understand how to suppress these immune responses, we would be credential, what I call credentialized in the field because we would have a review article on this topic that I could cite. And well, I can't tell you whether or not that was a def de de uh, de uh, deciding factor, but we did get the grant, okay? Uh, uh, you know, like I said, I can't do the control, but that's a, a kind of circumstance where you might want to consider writing a review article because it's going to do something for your career in one way or another, okay? But in general, uh, unless, as I've said, unless it's an outstanding journal that has great, neck, great name recognition and there's substantial gravitas to publishing in that journal, I think writing reviews, even for what I would say are respected, but not really very well known or highly regarded uh, high impact publications, it's not likely to impress your peers. It's not likely to make any difference in whether or not you get a grant funded, and it's not likely to play a major role in consideration. Okay, so all of this talk has been about how to write papers, how to position yourself to write papers, how to deal with collaborations, how to work with people in your laboratory in terms of um, uh, constructing the papers, uh, how to deal with referees, how to, how to deal with, with editors. And, and the bottom line of, of all of it in an academic context is that for your promotion and for your progress and for your getting your grants and for your career, it's all about peer-reviewed publications that demonstrate that you're moving forward and establishing yourself as an independent investigator. Most of you are still at the non-tenured or non-associate professor level. You're, you're right. You're getting ready for the, the, the critical step in academic advancement, which is the make or break step of going from assistant to associate, okay? And the major thing that's gonna make a difference for you is peer-reviewed publications. And what makes a difference in, in uh, I've had this discussion privately with several of you, is that um, what makes a difference is you're hired here on um, potential, okay? You've been in a great lab, or you haven't been in a great lab, but you've done stuff that really makes us think that you're going to be a good independent investigator. By us, I mean, you know, faculty who are going to vote on your promotion. Um, and we hire you on your potential. And anywhere between three and seven years later, you're going to be up to go to be promoted to associate professor, scientific career. How to, how to, how to do science well, how to get recognition for it in terms of grants, and how to get recognition for it in terms of from your institution. Okay? I think that's it. I think that's the end. Okay? That's it.